Hi everybody, this is James Tompkins and welcome to the second lecture of the International Finance Series. So I'll start off with the way I usually start and that's an agenda and basically I'll get into the goal of what we're going to do today and as you'll see it's going to relate highly to, if you will, some key principles of foundations of finance. In particular, I'll discuss efficient markets and, and value and arbitrage. Now, I sort of think of this as a, an introductory lecture. This, this, is, this is definitely not going to be your typical lecture. You know, the next lecture is when we start much more um, focused lectures as it relates to the theme of this class, which, by the way, do you remember what that is? International financial principles as it affects firm value. But today what I'm going to do is I'm going to assume you have you know, not a rocket science, but a, but a reasonable understanding of regular domestic corporate finance. And, and then what I'll do is I'll say, all right, well, here are some key principles that you learned in regular domestic corporate finance. And how it, does the world change in a sense with international finance? How are things a little bit different? So it's very much of, as I mentioned, an introductory lecture. So let me again begin with the first uh, principle of foundation, and that is efficient markets. So, by the way, what is, uh, for example, an efficient stock market? Well, what happens at a marketplace? People buy and sell, right? So when this little piggy went to market, this little piggy bought roast beef, right? And so what gets bought and sold at a stock market? Well, stock, right? Shares of companies. And so when I say Apple is priced to say $500 a share, then what does it mean to say that it is efficiently priced? Well, let me ask you this. True or false? When there's a flow of information, do stock prices react, or at least potentially react, to flows of information? So not to be morbid or anything, but for example, when those planes flew into the towers, was that a flow of information? It was, right? And did the markets react? They did, right? So basically, a stock market is efficient, or things are priced efficiently in, in that stock market, if when there is a flow of information, number one, the change is immediate, so it doesn't take its time. And number two, it's whole. In other words, it neither overreacts nor underreacts. Okay, so for example, okay, let's say, hang on one second here, let me just do a little drawing. Let's say that Apple is kind of, you know, chugging along. Okay, so here's Apple stock price and it's chugging along. Okay, and then uh, they announce, hey, we're going to get into the iPhone. Okay, so let's say at this time it's uh, it's $350 a share. And then as soon as they announced that we're going to get into the iPhone, what do you think the reaction was? Do you think the stock price just ignored that, kind of yawned? Or you think it reacted to it? Probably reacted, right? So let's say it jumped from 350 to say, you know, $370 a share. And then it continued to sort of to do its thing. Okay. So here's the announcement. And upon the announcement, it jumped from 350 to 370. So, so number one, if this jump is immediate, doesn't sort of take its time, and if that $20 is neither an overreaction nor an underreaction, then the 370 would be said to be efficiently priced. I got a little bit more detail to add to that, but that's that's basically what is meant by a stock that's efficiently priced. So if we uh, if we go on, basically, depending upon how you define information, would be such that you could sort market efficiency into three categories, or if you will, classifications. Another one, there's weak form efficient, in which case information is past prices. There's semi-strong form efficient, 
in which case information is past prices and public information, and then the strong form efficient. And now the information is past prices, public, and private information. Now I know that probably doesn't make a lot of sense right now, so let me let me try to give it some, some meaning, okay, as far as these classifications go. So essentially, when you think of the market being efficient, what does your intuition tell you? Are we talking a, a level playing field or an unlevel playing field? Well, hopefully your intuition, and I know it's, it's definition, so I'm relying on intuition here, not really understanding, but hopefully your intuition is that when you're thinking efficient, you're thinking level playing field. Okay, and so let's take the the past prices. Okay, remember we said a, a stock price was efficiently priced when, with the flow of information, number one, its reaction was what immediate and whole. Okay, so now we're saying for weak form efficient. Yeah, if the stock is weak form efficiently priced, now that flow of information we're confining to being strictly past prices. Now suppose I had a model of past prices and I could on average correctly predict the direction, say. I mean I I wouldn't even have to predict the exact amount. If I could predict the direction, whether an app whether a stock was going to make gain or lose the next day, could I make a ton of money? So in other words, let me put it this way. Okay, so maybe I have a hundred days ago that um, Apple was priced at, say, $500 a share, and then $99 days ago, maybe it's here, you know, $4.99 and a half, and so I have all these prices, and let's say today, it's at, uh, it's at $525 a share, okay? So, so here we have 100 days ago, and $500 a share, 99 days ago, $499, so I have all of this information, and if I could create a model or, or, or some kind of formula, right, where if I could create some kind of formula or model where the next day I could correctly predict or expect to correctly predict whether Apple's stock price would go up or down in value the next day, could I make a ton of money? I could, right? So using past prices, if this model existed, and if I could expect to beat the market on a risk-adjusted basis, would you call that a level playing field or an unlevel playing field? Well, presumably when you expect, doesn't mean you're guaranteed, but when you expect to beat the market on a risk-adjusted basis, that would be an unlevel playing field. And therefore, if that model existed, and therefore it created an unlevel playing field, would that mean that that particular market was weak form efficient, level playing field, or weak form inefficient, unlevel playing field. Weak form inefficient, right? And 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 so so essentially, when you think about market efficiency in those various categories, if with the layer of information you're talking about, you expect to be able to beat the market on a risk-adjusted basis, then it's efficient level playing field or inefficient unlevel playing field? Inefficient unlevel playing field. So for example, we talked about strong form efficient, right? So if we go back to this example right here, now when, when the iPhone was announced, Steve Jobs was still around and he, and he was CEO of Apple. And uh, so let's say you're, you're jogging along right here and, and it's a week beforehand and, and whoa, <laughs> you cannot believe your luck. There is Steve Jobs, and he's he's jogging in the park right next to you. You go, Psst, yo, buddy, got any information for me? And 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 Jobs says, yeah, man, yeah, we're, we're gonna announce the iPhone in a week. Okay, now with that information, not guaranteed, but could you expect to beat the market on a risk-adjusted basis? Well, presumably, could you could, right? Because you would expect that when this was announced, that it would go up. And so you could buy the stock before it was announced, in other words, with private information. And so therefore, when we talk about strong form efficient, does that mean you do or you do not expect to beat the market using past prices, public information, and private information? 
You do, right? And if you expect to beat the market on a risk-adjusted basis, would that be level playing field or unlevel playing field? That would be unlevel playing field, right? And so therefore, would you, would you say that the market was therefore strong form efficient or strong form inefficient? Strong form inefficient. So in any case, those are just three sort of categories of, of uh, you know, market efficiency. And, and by the way, just as sort of a, a segue, do we want the markets, the financial markets, to be as efficient as possible? At least from a, uh, from a society point of view. You know, if we're managing our economy that on average, say, increases people's standard of living. We'll use that as a way to define benefit. Is there, is there anyone watching right now that would prefer a lower standard of living? Well, I mean, you know, there might be one or two, but, you know, personally, on average, people tend to rather drive a nicer car than a bicycle or live in a house versus a mud hut, you know, et cetera, et cetera. So, so here's, here's my question. Would we like policies in, the pl in place that ceteris paribus make the financial markets more efficient, or do we not care? Is it okay that they're, they're inefficient? Well, some of you might say, well, we want them to be efficient. And, and then you might say, well, we want them to be efficient because it's not fair. Right? Some people will make money at the expense of other people. But <laughs> is it also fair to say that what is Fair to one person is not fair to another. In other words, fair can be, or the whole concept of, of what is and what isn't fair is, is subjective. Is that a fair statement? Probably it is. You know, just the fact that it's a matter of opinion would suggest that there's some subjectivity involved there. So can, can anyone give me an argument as to why ceteris paribus, which means all else being equal, it is in our society's best interest to have financial markets relatively more efficiently priced as opposed to less efficiently priced. Well, let, let me ask you this. Whether it's fair or not, if, if you know that, hey, the financial markets are inefficiently priced. So, for example, let's go back to the days when insider trading was legal. And, and by the way, what, what famous family made a ton of money from insider trading. In other words, they expected to beat the market on a risk-adjusted basis with private information back when it was legal. It was the Kennedy family. It was Joe Kennedy in, in Boston. He had all these contacts and, and so on and so forth. And in fact, they, they asked him to help write the laws, at least this is my understanding, they asked him to help write the laws to make insider trading illegal. But in any case, let's get back to the argument of, well, you know, why would we like the financial markets to be as efficient as possible without relying on any sort of fairness uh, concept? And that is, the more inefficient it is, you and me as an investor, if we buy stock and, and we know it's not efficiently priced, does that make it more risky for us or less risky? That makes it more risky right? It, it, it's an unlevel playing field. And, and so if it's more risky for us, then what has to happen to our required returns for us, if you will, to be bribed into being willing to, say, buy stock? Would we require higher returns if it's more risky or, or lower required returns? Higher, right? Now, now, how how does that work out with the stock price? You know, if if, if let's say, um, you know, it, it's it's risky to buy Apple because it's inefficiently priced, and therefore we require higher returns. Does that mean that we, we we're only willing to buy it at a low price, or we're willing to buy it at a high price? Well, under what circumstances are you more likely? to earn a higher return when you buy something low or when you buy it when it's already high? When you buy it when it's low, right? So if Apple or some other company is issuing stock, but the, the market itself is, 
is is very inefficient, and so therefore there's a lot of risk for investors, and so therefore investors say, hey, we require higher returns, and so th then they say, all right, well, therefore we're only willing to buy it at these low prices, and a company wants to to, to raise money with, with stock capital, they want to go to the capital markets and raise money, then then what is happening to their cost involved when they're raising the capital? Is, is it costing them more to raise that capital because people will only buy it at lower prices? Or is it costing them less to raise that capital? Well, it's costing them more, right? And if it costs them more to raise that capital, does it make it more likely or less likely that they'll build that new plant or hire those new workers and so on and so forth? Makes it less likely, right? It means the MPV, net present value, is more likely to be negative. And what does that do to our economic growth? If companies now are less likely to, to build those new plants and hire those new people, et cetera, et cetera. Well, that, that it, it's going to dampen our economic growth. So, so there, there's an example. That there are some whys, by the way. Uh, by, and there are different schools of thought, by the way. But there, there are some whys, if you will, behind... Okay, well, why did we pass insider trading laws? And, and that's my goal, by the way, just as a quick sort of side, side issue. That's my goal in this class, not just to say, hey, you know, here's, here's a bunch of stuff, this happened, that happened. You know, my primary goal is to get into the whys. And uh, in, in fact, often with what I call the what's, you know, I, I'm, I'm not going to remember that stuff. I'm going to have to look it up and et cetera, et cetera. But it's the whys that are important to me in this class. So let's get back to this, this, this concept of market efficiency. How is it important to international finance? Well, let me ask you this. Do you make money or, or expect to make money on a risk-adjusted basis by taking advantage of market efficiencies, level playing field, or market inefficiencies, unlevel playing field? Well, it's, it's the inefficiencies, right? I mean... If, uh, if for example, you know, we'll, we'll use the playing field. I mean, if, if you've got your kid's, you know, 10-year-old YMC, YMCA soccer team and they're playing Manchester United, is that a level playing field or unlevel playing field? That's unlevel, right? And if you had the opportunity to bet on Manchester United, then could you expect to make money on a risk-adjusted basis? You could, right? Obviously, you have to be on the right side of that playing field. And so, so companies or investors or whoever, you know, they, they expect, not guaranteed, but they expect to make money on a risk-adjusted basis when they can spot market inefficiencies, i.e. unlevel playing field. So why is this important, this whole concept, if you will, of market efficiency important to international finance? Well, to answer that question, you know, let, let's take a look at, um, you know, some of the, uh, you know, opportunities that companies have. So, so let, let's look on this side, for example. Here we have the asset investment decision, which is, by the way, what? Well, it's what a company spends its money on, right? That's its business plan. Okay, so if it's Coke, they might you know, invest in bottling companies. And if it's, if it's Apple, they might hire a bunch of R&D sciences and software engineers, et cetera, et cetera. So this is, this is a company's business plan, arguably the most important decision a firm makes. So let me ask you this. If we just confine the world to the United States, would you say the asset markets are efficient? In other words, everyone has an equal chance of either making or losing money when they get into what they decide to spend their money on, i.e. their business plan, or would you say it's an unlevel playing field? Well, let's take Coke. Suppose I decided, hey, <laughs> you know what, Coke, I I'm going to get into the, the uh, soft drink business. And just to really rub your nose in it, I'm, I'm going to do it right here in Atlanta, and I'm going to, where your headquarters are, and I'm going to plan on dominating the, the soft drink uh, business right here in Atlanta. In fact, all of Georgia, you know, I'll tackle your home state. Now, who do you think would win that battle, me or Coke? Well, if you said me, thanks for your vote of confidence, but 
let's be realistic, Coke would, right? Because they enjoy a market inefficiency in their asset market. In other words, a competitive edge is, is another way of putting that. And so, you know, a lot of people say, well, you know, they have this secret former and I don't know, I, I could be wrong. Frankly, I find it hard to imagine if we can map out the DNA and that, that we can't figure out Coke's secret formula. Um, you, you know what their real competitive edge is, in my opinion? And again, I could be totally wrong on this. Here's your first sea story of the class. But I, I remember going on ships, you know, just all over the world. And, and, and this was back in the, uh, this would have been the mid to late 70s and also during the 80s. And... We, we might be going up a jungle river in Malaysia or whatever. And no matter where we want, went, guess what was for sale? Coke. I mean, their ability to get their product all over the world is just absolutely phenomenal. But in any case, the point is that, you know, the asset market domestically are not, you know, are, are full of market inefficiencies, meaning companies have the opportunity to make or lose money or they expect to make or lose money on a risk-adjusted basis. They expect to make, right, with the business that they're in. So, so imagine this. Imagine, time for another diagram. Imagine, imagine that's the U.S., United States. Okay, that's the United States. And that is what they're confined to for their, if you will, asset investment opportunity set. And now... We expand that whole opportunity set. Now we expand that whole opportunity set to the world. Is that a big deal? Yeah, that is a huge deal. I mean, look at Walmart. Could Walmart be what they are today if for some reason there was a law saying, hey, by the way, you've got to keep everything you know, all your everything you sell and everything you produce, all of that's got to be right here in the United States. Would their business plan have worked? No. I mean, they, they use the, the, the world as their shopping place. The world is their manufacturing place. Hey, you know what? I'm going to uh, do a bunch of my production in China because China has cheap labor to offer. And, and, and I'm going to sell a bunch of stuff in the United States because that's a plum market. And, and I'm going to be poised and ready to sell in China as, as they become more of a consumer-driven nation and so on and so forth. Okay? And so I can sit here in this this so-called virtual classroom and I can draw this cute little diagram, hey, you know, you've got these bigger opportunities. But my point is, is that we see it happening in the real world and it makes a big difference. This is not just something that's relevant in the classroom. So, so that's why this concept of market efficiency is, is so important as soon as we move from the domestic side of finance to the international. You know, point number one, companies expect to make money on a risk-adjusted basis from taking advantage of market efficiencies or market inefficiencies. Inefficiencies, right? And then at least for the asset investment decision, is there significantly more opportunity when you can expand globally instead of being confined to a single country? There is, right? And, and what about the other side? What about the domestic financial markets? So here we have debt. So that could be the, the New York bond uh, market and, and, and equity. That could be the New York Stock Exchange. Would you say that the domestic financial markets are relatively efficiently priced or inefficiently priced? Well, you know, this whole concept of market efficiency, I mean, getting back to this example, can you ever prove if I go, when Apple shot from 350 to 370 with my earlier example, could, could anybody ever prove that Apple at that price was efficiently priced? So when they announced the iPhone and it shot from 350 to 370, can anyone prove that? They can't, right? Why not? Well, what were the two conditions we talked about with market efficiency? That number one, the change had to be what? Immediate, so don't take your time. And number two, it had to be what? 
hull, which means neither an overreaction nor an underreaction. In other words, that $20 difference had to be exact. But the question is, how can anyone tell you what, what the exact amount should be? How can anybody tell whether it's an overreaction or an underreaction? You can't, right? And that's why during this class, often you'll hear me talking about if you believe the market's efficient. Or I'll use terms like relative, because that's, that's probably a much better point of view. So, for example, if we had um, IBM priced on the New York Stock Exchange, and we compare that to Zim, whatever that is, <laughs> priced on, say, the Zimbabwe Stock Exchange, which one do you think will be relatively more efficiently priced? Well, probably the one on the New York Stock Exchange. So in any case, yeah, there, there's, there could be some opportunities domestically for these prices to be inefficiently priced. So for example, uh, domestically, if somebody gets a small business loan and the government is subsidizing that small business loan, so in other words, if, if, if market rates for the risk that you'd be getting into with your small business would be, say, 7%, but the government says, hey, we're trying to encourage small business, so we'll pick up 2% of that, so you can really do it at 5%. Then is the process of you raising that capital, are you already in positive MPV territory if the government is subsidizing risk? You are, right? And so that would be an example of a market efficiency, level playing field, or inefficiency. Market inefficiency. And so, so I'm not saying there are no financial markets that, where there aren't market inefficiencies, but imagine again when you talk about the financial markets internationally. So again, you, you, you've got the opportunity to, to look globally. I mean, I'll give you an example. Um, Euro Disney, okay, when they went to set up shop in, uh, in France, well, the government basically gave them all kinds of great deals. So, for, for example, they, they, uh, the, the land, they let them buy them at 1960s prices or something like that. And, and I think, I'm not sure about this, but I think they also subsidized some of their financing. I, I could be wrong about that. But if they did, then that would be an example of a market efficiency or inefficiency. Inefficiency. Or it might be that, hey, you know, Coke is, is, a, is a big fish in a little pond. Maybe they, they set up shop in Namia, okay? And uh, so Namia says, hey, we, we, want, we, we want you, Coke. We want you to, you know, create jobs here and so on and so forth. So, so we'll, we'll lend you money. So if, if they did that, then uh, would that, the, the process of raising money, would that be consistent with market efficiency or inefficiency? inefficiency, right? Okay, so let's get to another key principle, the foundation of finance, and, and that is this whole notion of value. Now, what is value a function of? Well, risk and return, right? And in your regular corporate finance class, domestic finance class, what, what model did you use to measure value? You want a clue? Oh my, look at the time. Well, the time value of money model. And what two things were involved in that model? Well, you needed cash flows and a discount rate, right? And so I'm not going to reteach all of this stuff. If you want to, you can look at the time value of money. I think it's lecture two in the corporate finance series that, that really gets into uh, depth with time value money, but basically the value today is the sum of expected cash flows discounted to today, where you have some sort of an appropriate discount rate. And so what I want to make is a point with the expected cash flows. I could make a point with the discount rate, but it's, it's more theoretical in nature, and, and so I'm, I'm going to stick to uh, what bridges into practice and, and that's relevant to this class. So I'm going to make a point about the expected cash flows. So here, here's a question. Should a multinational corporation 
try to reduce its variability of cash flows. You know, it's reduce its risk. Well, you might say, well, you know, if they reduce risk, but they also give up return, and so there's the typical risk-return trade-off. But what if, what if they could reduce the variability of their cash flows without giving up any return or any ex expected or required return? Would that be happy face or sad face? That'd be happy face, right? And, and so what we're going to get into is, is a key reason behind why some, some companies choose to hedge, which is another term we'll get into in the, in the second part of this course when we look at managing exchange rate risk. But basically, the argument goes that, well, let's say I'm a, I'm a widget company. So if I'm a widget company, do I take on widget risk? I do, right? And, and that's going to have a certain risk. And, and along with that risk, will there be required returns? There will, right? Now, exchange rates are another risk, right? And if I can reduce the variability of my cash flows in my widget business because I, there are ways or there are techniques that I can uh, reduce or eliminate unexpected cash flows due to unexpected exchange rate movements, then I'm basically getting rid of risk. And, and does the rest of the world know with the widget industry whether some companies choose to hedge and others don't? In other words, does it really have an impact on the required returns of the widget industry? It doesn't, right? I mean, that's, that's widget business. And so basically, you know, that's the theoretical argument, and I'll get into a lot more detail when we look at this in more detail in the second half of this class. But, but that's an argument behind why companies choose to hedge. They go, hey, you know what? We can get rid of some of this risk, and we don't have to give up any of our required returns. So let's look at why, okay? So low variability of cash flows, or in other words, low risk, results in higher expected cash flows. Remember, that's what was on top of that time value money. And it's basically the following argument. Yeah. A, a company with more stable cash flows, is it fair to say that they have a higher or lower probability of bankruptcy? Probably lower, right? And so with a lower prob probability of bankruptcy, what we're basically saying is that they can, for the lower probability of bankruptcy, they can expect higher sales. They can expect lower expenses for an identical, say, service or product or whatever. And, and I know we've got some adjustments to make, etc. But I'm just very loosely calling sales minus expenses as expected cash flows. So, so let, let me give you an example of why this is the case. Let, let's talk about sales, okay? So imagine you've got two companies. Or, or imagine we've got, say, hurricanes come into North Carolina. And so when hurricanes come to a particular state, does that, does that attract a lot of contractors and so forth? It does, right? So let's say that your roof blows off and, and, and you've got this company that's just been around for 30 years in your area and fixing roofs. We'll call that, we'll call that company stable stable roofs incorporated okay and uh, and then you've got another company and they've come in their fly-by-night operation and and they haven't been around before they, they're just attracted there because of the hurricane and we'll call them fly-by-night roof company now for the same roof okay identical product would you be willing to pay more money or less money to the stable roof company? Presumably more money, right? So that means higher sales for the stable company, the company with the lower variability of cash flows. Now, what about expenses? Let's say that, well, hey, you know, you've, you've just gotten your degree in finance and Oh, gosh, you, you, you're just so desired on the marketplace and, and, and the investment bankers want you and, and, and Goldman Sachs says to you, hey, come work for us. We, you know, we, we, we want you. And, and then you've got this, this other investment bank. Let's say they're located here in Atlanta and, and, and they've just started. They haven't been even been up and running for six months 
and they want you for the exact same job. Now, what would they have to do to attract you to work with them instead of Goldman Sachs? Well, would they have to pay you a higher salary to bribe you into going with them or a lower salary? A higher one, right? Because it's, it's higher risk for you. You don't know if they'll be around next year or whatever. And so basically, you're going to only go with them with a higher salary, which means you'd therefore be willing to go with Goldman Sachs for a higher or lower salary. Lower, right? And so, so we have essentially for the stable roof company, Ceteris Paribus higher sales. For the Goldman Sachs, had been around forever, therefore relatively more stable, lower expenses, and therefore that would mean higher or lower expected cash flows. Higher expected cash flows. And so this is relevant, as I mentioned, to the, or this whole concept is relevant to the second half of this class when we look at managing exchange rate risk, not only in the short run, but also the long run. So finally, I want to get to one more key principle or foundation of finance, and that is this notion of arbitrage. Now, does anyone know what arbitrage is? What does arbitrage mean? Well, it's definition, right? It's not, it's not understanding. And, and the easiest way is to explain it with, a, with an example. So imagine that Ford sells on the New York Stock Exchange for, say, $50 a share, and on the London Stock Exchange for $48 a share. That is after you adjust for exchange rates and transaction costs and so on and so forth. And this is at a point in time for the exact same stock. So here's my question for you. What kind of buying and selling activities would occur? Would everyone be buying in London, uh, buying in New York and selling in London? Let's think, buy high, sell low, eh, not a good idea. I know, would everybody be buying in London and selling in New York? They would, right? Imagine that, buy low, sell high. Probably learned that in your finance classes. And for every share that they did that, how much money would they be making? $2 a share, right? And that's and, and when that happens, or if this situation happened, would you expect to beat the market on a risk-adjusted basis? You would, right? In fact, in this example, because with, with one push of a button for the same stock at the same point in time, in that case, you wouldn't just expect, you'd be guaranteed. That'd be an example of riskless arbitrage, where it's guaranteed. There's, there is no risk. In any case, if, if everyone is buying in London, then what would you expect to happen to the price of this stock in London? Go up, right? Let's say it goes up to, say, $49 a share. And if everybody's selling in New York, what do you think would happen to the stock price in New York? Go down, right? So let's say it goes down to $49 a share. So when that happens, what is, what's happened to the arbitrage opportunity? Is it still there or is it gone? It's gone, right? And in finance, in fact, we'll be doing this in, in lecture three when I talk about uh, the principles of free trade. We assume, we often make the assumption that prices adjust until there are no longer any arbitrage opportunities. And, you know, when I talk in this class about assumptions, I, I really stress that it, it's, it's very important to understand assumptions when it comes to bridging theory with practice. And I'll, I'll be demonstrating that in this class as we proceed. So some types of arbitrage that are relevant, well, I already described the riskless one, because with one push of a button at the same point in time for the same stock, if we could buy low and sell high and lock in $2, that, that's riskless, there's no risk. But there's also a notion called risky arbitrage. That's where you expect to make money on a risk-adjusted basis, but it's not guaranteed. So, for example, some of these quote-unquote hedge funds, which, by the way, is just a generic term for different 
trading strategies and, and, and so forth. Um, but a hedge fund might have a, a, a deal where they can look at, say, Home Depot and Lowe's, and maybe Home Depot relative to Lowe's is overpriced and Lowe's is underpriced. And so with their model, what would they do? Well, if Lowe's is underpriced, would they want to buy it? They would, right? And if, if Home Depot is overpriced, would they want to sell it? They would, right? And, and so that is an example of risky arbitrage because now, even though at a point in time, their model is showing one to be overpriced and one to be underpriced, is it different stock? It is, right? So is it guaranteed? It isn't, right? So, but that would, so that would be an example of risky arbitrage. What do you think tax arbitrage is? Well, suppose you have uh, a tax rate in a country that's relatively high, let's say United States. United States right now has a pretty high, um, one of the highest corporate tax rates in the developed world, maybe the highest, I forget. And, and let's say you have, say, Ireland, a, a relatively low tax rate. So what kind of incentive, if it can be done legally, exists for a corporation to do? Where would they want to shift their profits? To the low tax rate country or the high tax rate country? Well, the low tax rate country, right? And that's an example of what's called tax arbitrage. So in any case, that's, that's it for this particular lecture. Again, the goal was just to take a few key principles or foundations that you probably learned in your regular domestic corporate finance class and then say, hey, you know, how, how are things, or how is this relevant to international finance? As I said, this was not a typical lecture. Do, do not judge uh, what to expect by this lecture, because from, from here on forth, our goal, or the theme of this class, is international financial principles as it affects firm value. And value is a function of what? Risk and return. And what element of risk are we going to be focusing on? Exchange rates. We're going to look at understanding why the dollar goes up and down in value. And that's just a starting point. And so the next lecture is about free trade. And it's just part of the cog of understanding why the dollar goes up and down in value. That, that is my reason for the next several topics that we're going to get into. So I hope this has been a good learning experience. And I will hopefully see you at the next lecture. Take care. Bye-bye.